It's my pleasure to introduce um, Joe and Kathy Garcia Prats. They have been married for 36 years and are proud, the proud parents of, oh, 10 sons. <laughs> <laughs> Authors of several books. You know, as we, were, as we were coming up here, I said, you know, what happens when the oxygen mask and you can take care of yourself and then your children? What happens when you've got 10 sons <laughs> to take care of? But uh, anyway, they're gonna share with us their, their beautiful story today. They are the authors of several books and articles on family, marriage, and parenting. They also lecture internationally as a couple and individually on these important subjects. Um, Kathy and Joe have appeared on numerous TV talk shows, including the Oprah Winfrey Show. In 1998, the Garcia Pratt's family was honored as Houston's Family of the Year by Family Services of, of um, Greater Houston. In 2009, Kathy and Joe were the recipients of the Standard of Christ Award presented by the Jesuit Volunteer Corps South. Joe is a professor and practicing neo neonatologist at Baylor College of Medicine. And in 2007, he received the Arnold J. Rudolph Lifetime Teaching Award at Baylor College of Medicine. Kathy is a former first grade teacher and among her many other community activities, she currently serves on the Board of Family Services of Greater Houston and on the founding board of Christ, Cristo Rey Jesuit College Preparatory. Together, Joe and Kathy have, have served as marriage preparation sponsors for over 27 years. We are very blessed to, by their presence and their expertise, and um, please help me to uh, welcome them today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Joe and I are really excited to be here. We, we enjoy sharing our experiences with, with all of you. I'm gonna to start today with, with a reflection. And it's a reflection that was written by Pedro Arupe, who is a, a Jesuit, a Jesuit priest. He was um, actually the, uh, what would, uh, Master, General. Master General, is that what we'd call him? Okay, Master General. Um, so this is his reflection. Nothing is more practical than finding God, that is, than falling in love. In a quite absolute final way, what you are in love with, what seizes your imagination, will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning, what you do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read, who you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. Fall in love, stay in love, and it will decide everything. <clears throat> As Adam said, Joe and I have been married 36 years and parents for 33. Um, our sons range in age now from 33 to 15. Um, there's, they range in age. We have the first two are 360 days apart, um, and the biggest span is, is three years. So, you know, we have, have them all over the world now. They're um, doing many different things. But when Joe and I started out 36 years ago, um, actually it would have been closer to 38 years ago when we first met, um, we didn't, didn't have all the answers, and we still don't. We're still learning, we're still growing. We still go and, and learn and go to seminars and conferences. We read books. Um, we're continually learning and growing because marriage and relationships are a process because we continually change and, um, and our relationship changes. And I think we, as Father said, you have to be flexible. Um, I'm gonna tell you a story about being flexible. My, my dad tells us, Kathy and Joe, flexible. They are very flexible. And this all started before we even got married because I called my dad. My parents were in Virginia. Joe, I was in New Orleans still at the time. Joe was here doing a, a pediatric residency. And we called him to tell him that I was engaged. Um, engaged to someone who they had not met at that point in time. Um, Joe was in medical school the summers. You know, he was doing in externships and things like that. Um, so the opportunity hadn't hadn't arisen for Joe to come and visit. So we're telling him we're, we're engaged. Um, we had decided to get married in New Orleans, not Virginia. And, um, but, you know, we want to be real flexible. We can get married between Thursday and Saturday <laughs> of this week. Um, because I was graduating from Loyola on, on Monday, Joe could only get a, a week off. He wanted to be there for my graduation. And 
you know, so we, we only had this time frame. So we got married on Monday. We had rehearsal on Tuesday. Got married on Wednesday. Um, we, we laugh. We started out on fast forward, and we're still waiting for the pause button a little bit. Um, when Joe and I first met, um, it was a blind date. M a mutual friend, uh, my best friend's sister, who was dating another medical student, um, kept telling us, y'all need to go out, you know, oh, I want you to meet this guy. And he's, she's telling Joe, oh, you need to meet Kathy. Um, it took us about three months before we both agreed to go out. Um, she kept saying, you will have a good time. Go out and just have a good time. We went out. Joe takes me to a Mexican restaurant in New Orleans. <laughs> we had a good time. <laughs> this was the, probably one of the funniest experiences we probably have had to this day. I mean, this waitress came out. She had lipstick that covered most of her face. And when <laughs> we placed the order, she just yelled it back to the kitchen. <laughs> so, but we had a good time. And I think that's where it starts. You have to go out and meet and be friends. Joe and I were friends before anything moved beyond that, primarily because I wasn't looking for a long-term relationship at that point. I was looking to finish my education, look at different opportunities were, that were out there. Um, and so it was, it was a friendship relationship. It was a relationship where we just started going out, having a good time, um, kind of finding out about each other, learning what, what was important to him, what was important to me. Um, I had had other, other um, young men that I had dated. There were things I knew I didn't like, didn't want in, in a person, other things that I knew I wanted. Dated someone who was not Catholic, did not share my faith, didn't understand my faith, didn't understand where I was coming from. I realized that was important to me. I needed someone who could understand when I said this is important to me in my relationship and in, in who I am that they also could appreciate that and identify with it. So you start looking for things that are important to you, those values. Um, I remember hearing a speaker years ago and she was talking to young people, young meaning high school and middle school age, and she said, you know, dating is about, about dating and dumping, which is kind of true. You date someone, you find out, oh, I like this, I don't like this. And you dump them and you move on until you find those things that are important to you. So Joe and I, as we started out, we had to think about what was important to us. What did we want for ourselves as individuals? Because we've talked about that individual aspect of it. What did we want as a couple? And what did we ultimately want as a family? Because we knew we wanted a family. And we knew we wanted a large family. We always laugh, you know, Joe wanted five children, and I wanted five children. Do the math, you know. But I get to pick which five are mine every day. <laughs> I think I earned that, earned that right with 10 pregnancies, 10 labors, 10 deliveries. Um, and it'll vary from day to day. So, uh, but we did. We talked about certain things. But what did we want? We knew we wanted to be loving, caring, compassionate, forgiving, responsible, respectful, well-educated, and faith-filled individuals. Wow, it's kind of a lot. I think that's what God calls us to be, loving and caring, compassionate, forgiving, responsible, respectful, well-educated, and of course, faith-filled. And we knew if our children were going to live and embrace those characteristics, then Joe and I, every day, had to strive and I emphasize the word strive because we're just like everyone else. There are good days and, and bad days, hard days, challenging situations. And yet we, we have to strive to be that loving, caring, compassionate, forgiving, responsible, respectful, faith-filled individual. We also wanted ourselves and our sons to appreciate that our self-worth would be measured in non-monetary terms. You know, we've been talking today about different things that are important to, to each of us and what we're looking for in that individualism, you know, that one aspect that you're, you're chasing, in some ways, the American dream. But the American dream is tied up in more and bigger and better. And 
very much sometimes in contrast to our faith and what God's calling us to. And too often when we're, we're in, in an educational environment and we're trying to think what we're going to do, we're more concerned about choosing this career than we are really thinking about what is God calling me to. And they can be very different. Sometimes they can, they can share the same path. But often what God's calling us to may not necessarily be that career. Because that career may be driven by the, how lucrative it is, how much prestige I may have from choosing that. So we have to look at ourselves, our self-worth, in non-monetary terms. Who we are, what we're doing with the gifts God's given us, and how we live our lives. Those values, those virtues, what we're doing. Is it hard? Sure. Joe and I have had to live very counterculturally because so many of the values of society are contrary to what we believed our faith was calling us to. You know, early on when, when Joe and I were first married and we would go to sometimes some of the, the activities of some of the residents and the interns and stuff, some get-togethers and parties, got to a point where we had to say, ooh, a lot of the things going on there were not in line with what we believed was appropriate. We would see a married, someone who was married with someone else. And it was like, oh my gosh. So we had to pull back from that. We had to pull back too because we saw that they were chasing that American dream. And was that really what we wanted? Was that really what was important to us? It was gonna be hard to have this big family and then chase that American dream. So it meant that we had to start making decisions and choices that enabled us to reach that dream. You gotta know what you want. You gotta sit back and say, what do I want within our relationship? Where do we want it to go? Because I think if you don't know what you want, you're gonna have a hard time getting there. You're gonna be influenced more and more by the societal values that are out there. And they're strong. And I think it's harder now, I see it with our own sons, that it can be really hard because there's been so much kind of indoctrination by, by what's out there. And we all become desensitized to what's right when we're constantly bombarded by what's wrong. So we're watching all those television shows, Friends, Sex in the City, all those things, and they glamorize so many relationships, but they're really not strong, faith-filled relationships. They're very empty. They're not about you becoming a better person. It's about using the other person. So we have to sit back and think, what do we want? And then we start making those choices that enable you to get there. It's like the comment made. You know, each of us has been given that free will. And then we have to use it as God would want us to use it. So when I get up in the morning, before I even get out of bed, I thank God for the gift of Joe and the boys in my life. May not be always one of those totally heartfelt gifts. Maybe there's some things going on with Joe and I, or there's just a lot of stress and, and demands. But you get up and you thank God for the gift of Joe and the boys in my life. And I don't stop there. I ask him to help me get through the day. I don't believe that God just gives us our, our, our spouse, our children, and then he wishes us good luck. Good luck, Kathy. I gave you 10 sons, work it out. He doesn't do that. But we have to ask him. Ask and you shall receive. And so I ask him to help me get through the day with all the things I know I have to do. And you know, when you have 10 sons and they were all at home at one time, there's a lot to do. They eat a lot. <laughs> when they were all home, five gallons of milk a day. We were at the grocery store a lot. You know, you get to the milk carton, I mean the milk section, and if someone was coming up that knew me, they would tell everybody, get your milk before Kathy gets there. It's gonna be gone. But you have all those things, all the wash that had to be done, all the mundane activities and chores that are just part and parcel of being 
in a relationship, in a family, whether it's cooking and cleaning and getting all those things done, you have to ask God to help you get through that. And not only help you get through it, but to do it with a happy heart. Because Jesus tells us we need to be happy givers and loving givers. But then I don't stop there because, like anyone else, all those things happen to us that are unexpected in the course of the day. I mean, all of us know how, you know, you wake up and, you know, you've got your day planned and then something happens. It can be something as simple as, Joe's on call, I have eight kids to get to school, and the car doesn't start. I need and wanted to get the boys to school. So you have to figure that out. You have to take those little minor crises and make them work. You know, and, and Joe's a great teacher for that. I mean, he works in a, a neo-ICU, and so he has, to, he has to take, you know, chaos and, and bring that calm to it. And so he's really taught us all how to deal with those crises. But how we deal with them is, is a lesson to the people around you and keeping it all in perspective and move on. And so facing all those little, those little challenges and asking God to help you get through it. Now, some of them are minor, like a car. Sometimes it's a health issue. There are a lot of things that happen in our life that we don't ask for. And yet, how we deal with them and how we approach them is really a reflection on, on where God sometimes is in our life. In fact, almost always is in our life. You know, there's, there's a quote that I love. It's not the absence or presence of problems that determines our peace. It's the absence or presence of God. And we need God to help us get through that day. People often ask, Kathy, how do you do it? It is not a me. It is a we. It's Joe and myself and our sons and our God. That's all interwoven into everything we have to do. And so we've learned over the years that you need love. Love is a choice like we talked about last night. It's getting up and making that decision that I will love. And some days, like I said, it could be a little harder than other days. But it's a decision you make. It's a choice. And like we heard last night, and it's kind of been reinforced today, it's about helping the people around you grow and reach their full potential in the eyes of God. Not in the eyes of society, because they can be different, but in the eyes of God. When we do marriage prep, we tell the young couples, your love for her should help her grow and be better. His love for you should help you be better. If you don't see that in a relationship early on, that what they're bringing, that other person is bringing to the relationship is not going to make you better, dump. Dump and move on. Learn from it and move on. Because it's not going to help you grow in the eyes of God. And so, love, respect. You know, a lot of this has been talked about, so we're going to kind of jump in and then we're going to kind of hopefully get into other things a little more in depth. But respect, you know, it's, it's how we talk to each other, how we treat each other day in and day out. Like we said, those positive words, that ratio of five to one with each other, but doesn't stop there. It's the same thing with our children. You know, if, if they hear a negative comment, it takes those five positive ones to undo the negative. We, we need to build each other up, not tear each other down. Over and over and over in scripture, we hear, use our tongue in positive ways. And so please and thank you are still part of our vocabulary with each other. Words of appreciation. But it can't stop there. We have to set the example, but we have to do it with our children too. We have to use please and thank you with them, that tone of voice. Too often we're ordering our children around instead of asking them to do things. You know, whether we order them or ask, they'll do it, but their response will be different. Joe coming home at the end of the day, you know, he can come in the door and he can look around and he can see that what's done and what's not done. My gosh, Kathy, what have you done all day? as I used to say, dare him, you know, <laughs> when I had three in diapers and, you know, things like that. But he didn't. 
He'd come in at the end of the day, and whatever needed to be done, he'd jump in and do. So whether it was finishing dinner, getting one of the boys to a practice, helping one of them with their homework assignment, you know, it became a we working together to reach the same objective. And so you have to have respect in how you talk to each other, how you treat each other, that tone of voice, the choice of words. They're powerful. Think about when someone says something to you, the effect it has on you, for good and for bad. And then realize your words and their effect on, on the people closest to you. Respect, we believe, is also about respecting each person for their uniqueness, their individuality, the gift that they are. The Holy Spirit gifted each one of us differently as teachers, as pastors, as ministers, as, as doctors. Every, every one of us has different gifts. Joe and I share many values, but we're very different, very different backgrounds. Joe is from a Mexican and Spanish background. I'm an Irish Italian. You know, we've, we've brought that family of origin with us, how his family did things, how I did things. We, we approach things sometimes from a different direction. Often we accomplish the same thing, but it can be done in a different way. <coughs> and so we have to look at those differences and not let them pull us apart, but bring us together. Because if we were exactly alike, same strengths, same weaknesses, think of all the gaps we'd have to fill at home. And so we use your strengths and build each other up. Ten sons, same mom and dad, course of three, three decades. We had them in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. But 10 unique individuals. God gifted each one of them differently. Not one of them has the whole package. There's no perfect son in the group. Perfect in the eyes of society, anyway. They're perfect in the eyes of God, because God made them that way. So we have sons that are intellectually gifted extremely bright. That's his gift. And we've encouraged him to use that gift to make a difference in the world. We have sons that are very creative, but creative in different ways. David loves the written word. He loves the English. Danny is creative, but he likes to build. One's an engineer. The other now is, is the dean of students at Crystal Ray Jesuit College Prep here in town. Some of them are athletically gifted, but athletically gifted at different degrees and in different sports. So we have to look at this uniqueness, help them appreciate who they are and the gifts they have, and then encourage them to realize that God is asking them to use those gifts to make a difference and to accept who they are. Respect. But that respect, as we, we've heard, is about respecting ourselves. It's hard to respect others if you don't have that self-respect. And by that, I mean you have to accept who you are. You have to accept the things you can change about yourself and the things you can't change. I'm 5'1". Nothing I do is going to make me 5'6". If I give Joe five more inches, 25 more pounds, rippling muscles. Will it make him a better husband? A better father? A better physician? No. And so some things about ourselves we have to accept. And then those things that we can change, we need to change and make better. Decide that I'm going to do something differently. I'm going to approach it a little differently. God stretches us. He sometimes puts things in front of us and says, Try this. I'm calling you to do this. I assure you, what I'm doing today was not on my radar. Never. I was a first grade teacher. I taught people that were this size. If I taught first grade, I knew that they would not be taller than I am. <laughs> I had a good shot at that. So talking to first graders was pretty easy. Loved it. But this evolved. This evolved. God called me to start doing this. Was it a stretch? Stretch. First time I talked and one of my sisters was in the back, she was shaking her head the whole time. 
And after the, after the talk, I said, well, what was this all about? And she said, I couldn't believe that was you in front of all those people because I was so shy and quiet. Now, my boys do not believe that. When my mother told them that, that their mom was so shy growing up, one of them said, Grandma, you're not supposed to lie. <laughs> so you, you, know, you, you were called and stretched to go in different directions. But you have to accept yourself. You have to appreciate yourself. And that's different than selfish love. A lot more that individualism, that society, the me, 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 me. Because God does want me, Kathy, to be Kathy. So he wants me to develop myself emotionally, physically, spiritually, and intellectually. And so I have to make sure that those, those needs are met and that we, we begin to understand there's a difference in needs and wants. So my needs have to be met, physical. I go in and I get my, my annual checkups. It's paid off for me in many ways because things have been picked up early and been taken care of. I walk. I walk because not only is it physically good for me, it's a stress release. And there were many days when you have all those little ones at home, it's stressful, it's hard. Joe could walk in the door and he could see that stress, you know, that it was up, probably ready to blow. And he'd say, why don't you go for a walk? Why don't you take a long walk today? So, you know, you, you met those needs. And I could do that with little ones. You can put them in a stroller. You can go to the park. But I needed a physical outlet. I needed to take care of myself physically, eating right, doing those things that took care of me. Emotionally, you need support. You need relationships. You need friends. And so I had to develop those. Yes, Joe was probably my primary relationship, of course, and support, but I had to go beyond that, especially once I stayed home and I wasn't teaching anymore. I had to develop whole new relationships and support. I used to laugh. I'd be driving down, the, down one of the streets, and I'd go by a little park, and there'd be moms there with little ones, and I'd stop. I'd stop and get my kids out of the car, and we'd, we'd be able to mingle and meet. But you need that. I grew up in a family of, of five girls. We have, I have no brothers. And, you know, girls talk, 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 talk. And so they're not here, but being able to connect with them is wonderful, and it's a support. It makes you feel good, and, and you can share those things that are going on in your life. You know, intellectually, I think we're, we're always challenged to learn more, to do more, to come to seminars, to read. And of course, what we read makes a difference too. It's kind of like, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So choosing to read things that are gonna, gonna teach me and make me better, help me to envision the world as God wants it, is good. And so we have to intellectually keep stimulated. You know, when you, when you have children, that's an easier thing to do because you're, you're constantly, I think, learning with them. Of course, you know, the boys get to high school and college, you know, so a lot of it's right over my head. Um, so, you know, but still, there's stimulating, stimulating conversations that we can get into. And faith-filled. It's a continual process that we have to develop in our lives. One of the most important lessons that I learned was the need for silence. Silence in my prayer life. Something that I didn't, didn't always recognize as a need. I realized that I was doing all the talking. And without that silence, you don't have an opportunity for God to speak to you. And the most wonderful thing that happened to me, probably one of the <coughs> changing experiences in my life, was what happened in, in my parish here. 29 years ago. Our pastor decided that we were going to have a perpetual, perpetual adoration chapel. And so Sunday morning, he gets up and he's talking about this, this chapel that is opening. And he's asking each one of us to commit one hour a week to the Lord. I'm in the back of church. Joe's on call. I have five little ones under the age of six. And I'm thinking, right. 
Where am I going to find one more hour in my day? Come on, God, you know, you're supposed to see everything. You can see I'm pretty busy here. But Father's last statement changed my life because he made this statement. I promise you one hour of peace and quiet. <laughs> You're the mother of five boys under the age of six. You don't get a lot of peace and quiet. And so I committed. I went out that door, signed up, eight to nine on Wednesday nights. I figured if Joe wasn't home, there were young high school kids in the neighborhood that could still watch the kids at, from eight to nine. It wasn't too late. And I committed to that one hour a week. And it changed my life. It changed my life because I was working through some, some challenging issues. You know, I heard all my life, emulate the Holy Family. And I wondered, how do I do that? You know, I got five kids. You know, there were days I was just overwhelmed with all the things that had to be done. And I struggled with it. What is God asking of me? You know, I'm married to a Joseph. He's wonderful. <laughs> wonderful husband, wonderful father but he's not St. Joseph. <laughs> and I'm a good mom, I'm a good wife, but I'm not Mother Mary. And then I thought it was kind of unfair because they had one son. <laughs> and he was Jesus. I have good sons, trust me, they're not little Jesuses. And so I struggled with it. You know, what is God asking? So over the course of time, as I'm sitting in that chapel, with that peace and quiet, God started unraveling for me my mystery. And what was he asking? No, I can never be Mary. Joe's never going to be Joseph. But we can't emulate what they did and how they lived. We can emulate that attitude, that acceptance of what's in our life. Accepting what God was giving me and what he was asking of me as a wife and a mother. Asking me to have that attitude of love, doing what I did out of love, not because I had to, not out of obligation, but out of love. And to remember that they had the presence of Jesus in their life. So do we. Jesus is there with us. And to remember that. And so it gave me a whole new approach to living and doing what I was doing. So where I was folding those clothes and getting everything done at home, now I could do it with a totally different heart. Because if we don't have that love, in the eyes of God, it means nothing. We can go back to that St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. You can have angelic voices, but if you don't have love, then you're just a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. You can have faith, enough to move mountains. But God tells us if you don't have love, it means nothing. You can give everything you have to the poor, give your body up to be burned. But if you don't have love, it means nothing. As a wife, as a mom, just change the words a little bit. I can do 25, 30 loads of wash every week. But if I don't do it with love in my heart, in the eyes of God, it means nothing. I can fix all the meals, make sure those, those hungry boys are fed, make sure their homework's done, make sure Joe's needs are met. But if I'm not doing it with love in my heart, in the eyes of God, it means nothing. And so that attitude, that approach, that acceptance sends a message if you do it with love. And it's hard. You know, washing clothes and ironing and mopping floors, they're mundane. Doesn't take a whole lot of mental capacity to do that. And so I think in our society, it's looked down on roles of mothers and, and what we're doing at home. And so you find that way to bring that extra joy into it. So how did I do that? I love music. I am not gifted like, like Peter here. I don't have any musical talent. You don't want me to sing. You don't want me to play an instrument. But I love music, and I love musicals. So I'm mopping that floor. 
I'm folding those clothes. I've got the sound of music on. The boys gag. I have Camelot. I have West Side Story. I love it. But I'm bopping along, singing along to that music. The boys emulate that now. Dare I tell them that they're emulating me? <laughs> but they do. Because in our home, Joe and I will fix dinner, but the boys do everything else. They, a couple of them, the younger ones, would always set the table, clear the table. And the older boys were responsible for getting the kitchen cleaned up. And they had a rotation. They figured it all out. And what do they do when it's their night? They pop that music in, whatever their group is, and there they are. They're singing along. You know, now Timmy's outside. He doesn't rarely says anything when we say, can you go mow the yard? Because he's got his iPod in, and he's singing along, you know, mowing the grass, edging. And so you find those ways to get those mundane activities done. We all have them. But our approach and our attitude makes a difference. So taking care of the me, the needs of me, is important. So Kathy the I doesn't disappear. What I like to think is, you know, before I got married, it was a capital I. Now it's a little I. So the I hasn't disappeared, but it evolves, and those I's become we's. It's we. It's a we in our home. Everybody has to be working together to make it work. Otherwise, everybody is those individuals. They're all doing their own thing. And we had to look at that with our commitments. What's going to work for us? When I had to decide what to do, I was a first grade teacher, loved it. Loved it. And yet, when I got pregnant with Tony, it was a decision I had to make. Am I going to, to teach and take care of the kids? And I had to make a decision that I felt was best for us in our situation. Was it a hard decision? Oh, yeah. Back in the, in the 70s, there was so much pressure. You think it's bad now. It was so bad. If you were an educated woman who chose to stay home, you were looked down on. I could be introduced to someone, and they would, I was up here until I told them I was a stay-at-home mom. All of a sudden, my intelligence went from here to here. Not because I'd done anything differently except make the choice to stay home. And so you have to do what's best for you, what's going to work for you and enable your relationship to grow. And when you do that, you make those decisions and, you, and you're doing them for the right reason, you'll feel at peace. Whether it's having a large family, choosing to stay home, you know, a, a, a career path that I think Joe will share, all of those things will make a difference because you'll feel at peace. I'm doing them because this is what I believe God is calling. So the eye doesn't disappear. It just becomes a different, different um, importance of focus. Often, almost always, the needs of Joe and the boys came before my needs. A simple example is if, if one of the boys was sick and you needed to get up with him, it wasn't about, well, I'm tired and I'm just going to sleep. He's on his own. That need preceded my need for sleep. Educating the boys became a priority. And so we had to make decisions that enabled us to do that. We had to change our lifestyle or choose a lifestyle that enabled us to pay those tuition payments. I tried to convince the, the, the president at Strake Jesuit that if you paid for nine, you got the 10th one free. <laughs> he told me free was not in the Jesuit vocabulary. So, uh, you know. But, but sometimes that, that may be. I mean, Father, you made a comment, I think, about, about our society being family-focused. There are times when I felt like our church wasn't family-focused. In our parishes, we would do things that really were not helping us as family, whether it was a timing or, or an approach or whether it is tuition sometimes. We, we want our families to be open to life, and yet it's a struggle to say, how are we going to educate them in the Catholic faith? And so we have to look at that as a, as, a, as, a, as a faith community and how we're going to do that. Anyway, I'm going to pass it on to Joe, and then we'll, we'll get back. I'd like to touch on these last few minutes or all those um, 
what should I say, we can consider them either building blocks, blocks or stumbling blocks to our relationship. And um, uh, those issues that can cause conflict. Now, you've heard some of them already. And certainly, Father did a wonderful job this morning talking about just the, the conflict in, that we have existing in our society. But if you think about it a little bit, um, time, how we're going to use our time, money, uh, families of origin. Kathy's mentioned a few things about families of origin. We'll talk a little bit about that. Roles and responsibilities, religion, and sex. Uh, in uh, 2000, uh, Creighton has a Center for Family, uh, Center for Marriage and Family, and they did a study that um, young couples in their first five years of marriage, uh, the top three uh, issues that caused conflicts was time, sex, and money. So they're already, you know, the, the, the top three. Now, if anybody thinks those are only going to exist for the first five years of your marriage, uh, you're certainly deluding yourself because it's, it's something I think that challenges in the, uh, us all in the course of our relationships. So uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of those issues and how they challenged us, and I'm sure uh, as they challenge you in uh, your relationship and as you develop those relationships. Uh, well, first of all, time. Uh, what do you do with your discretionary time? Um, you know, I think uh, Father uh, Rupe's uh, little reflection, I think, uh, touched upon that. You know, what gives you that great peace and bliss and passion? Uh, uh, certainly, that's where you're going to uh, apportion your time towards. And so certainly, we put in right now, we put in time towards our study and school, our education, our careers. Uh, but in there, too, it's, it's how we're going to, what are we going to do with that uh, with that discretionary time. Uh, what are we going to do when we get home? Uh, I was a, when we first got married, I'm a big television watcher. I really enjoyed that. That was my escape from, from a busy day. And so it was, it was difficult for me to, uh, when we first got married, we'd, I'd come home and I'd turn on the TV set. And uh, that, that got to be uh, an issue because, especially when Kathy was home, she, she is, was teaching, and then when she stayed home with the boys, I may be the first adult voice that she's heard during the day, and uh, all of a sudden I just wanted to turn on the TV. So I had to, I had to learn that uh, that was really important a, uh, as to how I was going to use my discretionary time. Uh, so time spent with your, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, uh, time spent uh, studying, uh, time spent at sports, uh, time on the internet, on the cell phone, reading the paper, all of those things are important that you learn could be potential conflicts if they get in the way of that relationship. Um, you all certainly, in the course of striving for your relationship and building relationships, don't get into this, but eventually, and people have shown that having children gets in the way. How are you going to apportion your time with your needs and their needs, the needs of your spouse? So those are also challenges. Uh, uh, certainly when the boys came, a uh, big choice for me was read to the boys or watch Monday Night Football. And so uh, at first that was uh, a bit of a challenge and then it became less of a challenge when you turn off Monday Night Football and you read to Tony and David and Chris and Joe Patton. They're all sitting down and one of them's got his shoulder on your, uh, on your chest and they're having a good time. Well then that doesn't become such a hard choice after a while. But, but it, is a, it is very important that, uh, that you realize that how you use that discretionary time uh, says a lot about the value that you put on them, on that relationship. Um, you know, the, the one I like is uh, uh, the story I told the other day was <clears throat> Kathy and I were waiting up for one of our sons who had been out on a date. And so we were in bed reading, and we'd both kind of fallen asleep. And it was pretty late when he got home, late for us, I guess I should say 12 or 12.30. And um, Chris pops into the, the bedroom to tell us he's home, and we're both tired, and we're just glad he's home, and we just want him to say goodbye and Glad you're home, Chris. Did you have a good time? Yes. And then go to bed. Well, Chris wanted to talk. Well, you can't pass up that opportunity. A young teenage boy who wants to talk. It may be 1230, but this is a choice of using that time to build that relationship. So making choices about how you utilize that discretionary time becomes very, very important. 
Um, so balancing is, is uh, of your time is very, very important, and how you choose to balance it uh, will say a lot about the success or, the, or, or create challenges in the course of your relationship. Money. Um, I don't know if that's a big, should I say, a big issue for many of you now. Sometimes it is. Uh, we, we certainly, as you uh, get into your relationship, that, that's going to become kind of important. Uh, certainly now, if you both don't share a little bit about uh, what similar uh, choices about money, uh, you probably ought to take notice. If you'd like to just get up and, and go get a bagel on a Sunday morning, uh, as opposed to going to the champagne brunch. If one wants to just do one and one wants to do the other, y'all better talk a little bit about how you're going to how you're going to deal with those issues because as you get more into your relationship and then you have to decide, are we going to uh, spend our, our money on a very big, big fancy home, how we dress, the vacations we take, and you know, fathers mentioned it, you know, how we choose uh, those important things in our life. If, if we think that uh, the house that we live in, the car that we drive, the vacation that we take, the uh, uh, label on the clothes we wear, if those are very important, I think you're going to need to, to reassess uh, uh, those choices, especially with, uh, with the relationship and the individual you're developing that uh, relationship in. And we are certainly, um, what should I say, stuck in the world of consumerism. Uh, we get bombarded all the time with uh, what we need to have to be successful, be considered successful. So uh, Kathy tells a story that, you know, I drove a minivan for the longest time and uh, I probably was the only physician in Houston that drove a minivan <laughs> for the longest time. And uh, of course people can tell why, you know, Creighton, St. Louis University, Regis, University of San Diego, Seattle University, and Kathy said she wanted just right broke at the very back. <laughs> but that's choice. That's choice. That was a, certainly a big investment in, in our children, and we think eventually uh, to our world because we hope they learn those good values to extend uh, and give the things that they learned. So, so money can, can tend to be a, 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 an issue. Um, family of origin. Uh, that was something that um, I didn't really consider a, uh, an issue. Uh, I thought Kathy's family was wonderful. She thought my family was wonderful. They all seemed to get along. But um, that, that can sometimes be an issue. And, I, and I'm amazed at uh, the number of, of times that uh, it is an issue because families are different and we each grow up in our family and may be very different. Uh, one of my uh, uh, examples, we had a young couple that we did their marriage preparation and they came from very different family backgrounds. He had a he had a, fa a brother and a sister, and his mom and dad both worked, and they all ate dinner at different times. You walked in, you went to the refrigerator, you fixed yourself dinner, you finished dinner in front of the TV, then you went on and did your homework or whatever you need. That's just the way their family worked. The young lady, she came from a family, I think four girls, and they sat and ate as a family every night. They sat down and ate as a family. Well, when uh, the two of them started dating, uh, he would come over to visit, and he would go to the refrigerator and fix himself lunch and sit down. And she was just crushed that he would not wait for her to get something and sit and eat together. And he couldn't figure out why she was upset. Family of origin. Um, Kathy went to, uh, I guess it was a seminar on, on family about four or five years ago that was... Uh, it was sponsored by uh, University of St. Thomas and uh, the, one of the uh, priests who was telling the story about some of the counseling he was doing about how a marriage almost fell apart. And it had to do with when they opened Christmas presents. Oh, decorated the Christmas tree. I'm sorry. Decorating the decorated Christmas tree. Decorated Christmas tree. Yeah. One family bought uh, the Christmas tree early and decorated it, and the other family bought the Christmas tree on Christmas Eve and didn't decorate it till Christmas Eve. So real different traditions but they got, that got to be a huge conflict. It's a simple kind of thing. You wouldn't think that it would cause that much of a problem, but it does. Because it does cause, uh, or we come with our expectations of how things are going to be. And when they're different than the expectations of your 
boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, then it gets to be a problem. So, you know, we don't, we don't, really, we don't really think about it. You know, how did, how did your family deal with conflict? Did they deal with conflict? Uh, you know, were they yellers and screamers? Uh, that may be very different. You may have learned one way. Again, we talk about traditions. Uh, how did the family speak to each other? How did they deal with problems? How did families deal with alcohol? You know, in our family, uh, my uh, uncle, I grew up in El Paso, and he had a distillery in uh, Juarez. And during Prohibition, that's where, that's where everybody went to get their alcohol. And so we grew up around uh, alcohol all the time. It was used before dinner drink. Uh, we'd have some wine. We never saw anybody abuse it. That's just the way we grew up. Whereas other families, that was just not something that was, that was very common. Well, how are you going to meld that in the course of, of this new relationship? Is it going to be a conflict? Uh, so again, um, uh, big issue. Also, roles and responsibilities. What did you grow up with? What did dad do? What did mom do? In my traditional uh, Mexican Spanish home, my, I don't think I ever saw my father do the dishes, except when he wanted to really make my mom mad and show her <laughs> that she didn't fulfill her responsibilities, that he was having to do it. <laughs> so that was, that was uh, uh, not necessarily a good way, and I, that's not the way I wanted to have my uh, uh, relationship go. Uh, you know, and so mom, mom took care of the dishes and the kids and so forth. And so, you know, how did that roll? What did you grow up with? Well, that's the, that's the role, that's the family that you bring to your relationship. And so you need to be aware that that could be a source of conflict. Um, sexuality. Um, I think that's really a tough one. I, I see how my sons uh, are having to, the environment that they're having to grow up in, and, and I'm glad it's not me having to do that. Uh, because I think you all are challenged so much more than I was. You know, if you want to go look at one of those dirty pictures, you went to National Geographic. You know, that's kind of where, <laughs> where, uh, where we had to go look. Whereas now, you unfortunately don't have to go very far. And so you're really challenged. And that's really a, um, to me, that's very, very sad because I think we see such, I don't want to say, I think we see great conflicting uh, approaches to our sexuality. You know, we see, again, Kathy mentioned sex in the city, and uh, you, can't watch, you can't watch a football game without listening to something about Cialis. And it's really embarrassing with my sons watching football, and we've got to listen to the dadgum Viagra commercials. Um, so, you know, so you hear that and you see that sex in the city, scrubs, you go on and on about uh, the value of sexuality. And boy, it just fits right into everything you said this morning, Father, about the role of, of me. You know, you, you have to wear certain kinds of perfumes. You have to wear some kind of certain kinds of clothes. And all of these things make you better. You work out. You have good abs, you have this, you have this, and that's all to satisfy me so that I am a better sexual partner. Boy, and that's in such conflict with what uh, we certainly uh, hear from our church and what I think is, is indeed what Christ wants my, uh, us to, to see sexuality as. Um, to just give you a, the, what should I say, a contrast Certainly, John Paul, in his Theology of the Body, I think, really, really says it right, that uh, the body, and it alone, is capable of making visible what is invisible, the spiritual and the divine. It was created to transfer into the visible reality of the world the invisible mystery hidden in God from time immemorial. So, if this is the role of our body. It must indeed be very, very good because it was made by God. And so therefore the respect and the proper use of that sexuality, which is good, needs to be kept in the proper framework. But we're challenged. We're challenged with that in the course of our relationships and how we see each other. And there are a lot of other challenges in our sexuality, certainly gender differences. I mean, how men and women see sexuality is very, very different. 
Oh, that's just the way God made us. Some of it is good. Some of it is not so good. We just need to understand that. So, so that's, a, that's a, a, certainly a big, big challenge. I think I'm going to just... Um, um, Let me, let, me, let me just kind of end my comments by, um, by talking about three other things, and that is, what are you going to do to continue to develop this relationship? And I think we've all touched on it in the course of, of the afternoon and this morning. Um, what things can you do to, to kind of work on this relationship and, and make it better? And so I'm going to talk about the three L's. First of all, listening. I think uh, when, you're, when you're with that individual who's special to you or you think is going to be very special to you, um, you need to listen. And you're going to listen with your ears. That's the easy one. But you're also going to listen with your eyes. And you're also going to listen with your heart. Um, you can tell a lot by how someone says something, how important it is to them. So certainly that's the easy part because that's what we're used to. But listening with your eyes is kind of a little bit different. How do you listen with your eyes? Well, body language is basically another way. Kathy always says, I know, Joe, when you've had a good day or a bad day, when you walk in the door from your body language. I can tell. So you have to listen with your eyes. For me, it becomes a, something that I've had to learn. I think my, my uh, female colleagues are much, much better at this than I am. Sometimes we'll have a family conference, and I'll turn to my nursing colleagues and say, how do you think it went? And I learned a lot of things that I did not see that they did. So, so I think you have to listen with your, your eyes. And then you have to listen with your heart. I think that that's kind of something that uh, as you enter that relationship, uh, you need to do that other listening. Certainly you're listening here and here, but sometimes you have to really listen here. So listening is very important. Uh, labor. So listen and labor. OK, so labor, what do we mean? Well, Boy, certainly, uh, Dr. Barber's talked about it. You've got to work at it. It's not something that just happens. It's certainly you have to work at it. It's, it's something that you put time into it, just like you put time into your studies. You put time into developing your career. You put time into developing your sport, your endurance, et cetera. Same with that relationship. You have to put the time into it. Um, and then, uh, so listen, labor, and then you have to live it. What do you mean by living it? Well, I think it had to be fun. I think that that's, uh, that's something that I think you will tell in what is the right relationship, that it will be fun. So it'll be certainly, uh, uh, I think it's faith-filled. I think there's a lot of peace in that relationship. And, um, and sometimes, like, I think, you know, with listening to all the things that Father said, it's going to be a very countercultural experience than a cultural experience or an acceptance of of what you're surrounded with. So, so listen, labor, and live it. And hopefully those things will, will be active processes to, to let you all continue to develop that relationship. Um, but let, go back to just the faith component. And, and just kind of, you know, we talked a little bit about how, you know, that emulating the Holy Family and, and doing some of that. But there's some concrete things that I think, you know, Joe and I have, have learned have been important to us as a couple and as a family. And part of that is your prayer life. I think you must must develop your own individual prayer life, but but that prayer life between with with each other and then as a family. I think that's something that has has become such a um, what a, a strength within within our own family. We eat dinner as a family. People say, how do you how can you do that? Well, everyone that's home, we sit down and we eat dinner. The television isn't on. It's it's rarely on. Um, it's become very much of a, a soccer uh, video um, programmer, I guess you could say. The boys put videos in there and watch soccer. Um, but, you know, we, none of that is on. You know, because dinner is a time not only to feed your body, but your mind and your soul. And if we look at the experience of, of Jesus and how he taught, he taught so often over meals. And, and related over that. He used that time to, to build and to teach. And so we learn so much from, from, that, from, that, dinner, from that dinner time. Um, 
to this day. I mean, now, you know, with just a few of the boys at home, we are often there and we're, we've got conversations going and we're having to kind of remind them that, don't you have homework and, you know, some other things to do. But it's, it's in that time that you regroup, you come together and you share. We start our dinner off with a prayer, just the traditional blessing um, of our faith. And then we go around the, around the table. It's a long table, we had it made. And each of, each of us has an opportunity to say an individual prayer. And we have loved to see the boys mature in their prayers. I didn't grow up learning spontaneous prayer. I learned all the, the, the formal prayers of our faith, but we didn't grow up at a time when, when spontaneous prayer, meaning you just kind of spoke from your heart, was something that, that you did. But the boys have, thank God. And so we go around and they each say their prayer. You know, my dad, my dad kind of teases, you know, at a seminar I was giving in Virginia one time, you know, we, we were at tables like this and they were answering questions. And I hear my dad telling everyone, you never get a hot meal at Kathy's house. And I, I look at my dad and I said, Dad, I cook dinner almost every night because it's financially irresponsible to go out to dinner with 10 boys. And you males know that. <laughs> you know, they don't eat children's meals all the time. And my dad said, by the time everyone says their prayers, the food is cold. <laughs> but we've learned that that's such an important part of our, of our day, coming together and praying. Something else we started, what do you think, Joe, about 10, 12 years ago, was we, we started doing a family retreat once a year. And we would usually do it during the Christmas break because Joe could get a day off and the boys were home, especially those that had started going off to college. Um, we called it a day of, of playing and praying. Um, the older boys would usually put a prayer service together in the morning, and they always got even the littlest ones to do something. Timmy was real young, our first one, and yet he had something that he did. We would usually invite a priest to come with us, either to spend the whole day with us or to just come um, at the end of the day and say Mass. But it was a time for us to just put everything aside and, and concentrate on, on being family but praying. And we had a focus. We had develop a theme. Sometimes we did it, sometimes it was the priest. But we spent this day together. And it was a wonderful opportunity to kind of just regroup, to keep focused, to remind all of us that the importance of, of our faith in our, in our life, interwoven into all we do. You know, I remember one year Father, Father uh, Fee had everyone, he wanted everyone to spend about 15, 20 minutes alone in silence. Of course, you know, Timmy and, and Jamie were little. And I, you know, here we are, we were out at Circle Lake Retreat Center and, you know, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, um, I don't want them wandering off. But I, all it was was a little eye contact with the oldest of our sons, Tony and David, kind of telling us they're going to be just fine. We'll make sure they're fine. And I remember when we came back and Timmy just said, that was so cool. You know, just that silence. So finding that and interweaving it into your, into your hearts. And then be the light in the world. That's what each one of us in this room is called to do, to be the light in the world, to use those gifts God's given you to make a difference for those around us. It doesn't matter what career you're in. You can still touch lives. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't make a difference. You know, our oldest son is, is a pediatrician, and when he finished his training, he joined the Pediatric AIDS Corps that was established out of Baylor. And now he's over, he's over in Africa taking care of children with, with pediatric AIDS. So he's used that, that intellectual gift God's given him. You've got the others that are doing, you know, teaching and touching lives. But each of us is called to be the light in the world. It starts at home. It starts with your primary relationships, and then it goes out. It's not supposed to be covered up with that basket and hide your gifts and hide your, what you're doing. It's, it's got to go out into the world. Each of us is called to make a difference in the lives around us. Okay, question and answers? Do we have time? Okay. About five minutes. Oh, five minutes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. Questions? Um, Here, stand up and help me, Joe. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, work. 
you know, in this age of Big Brother, you know, and with kids changing, where do you draw the line between like um, control, you know, like a Big Brother kind of control, discipline, and having trust? Um, What's the balance? You want to go? You want me to? Driving carefully. All of those things go on. So that's kind of part and parcel. You know, you can stay up a little bit later now that you're a little bit older, but you do have increased responsibilities. That still means you need to still get your room clean, you still need to get to bed, you're, you're, you still have to do well in school. So there's kind of that, that balance. And it does get harder when you have them and they're at home, you get to, to see all of this. Then when they go to school, you lose a lot of that control. But what your prayer is that, that they've learned these basic tenets that you have, you have, hopefully you have lived them. So they've grown up with this at home and they can take that when they go out. Yeah, I got. I and I think you know just in in that whole issue, you know, in in families and with our our children, you have to s establish what your expectations are of them. Um, they need to be age realistic and child realistic. What sometimes we could expect of one six year old um, was was not what we could expect of another. He maybe not wasn't quite there, and so you had to establish those expectations, and then and and develop responsibilities. You know, uh, you know, if you get on my on our web page, there's a, a whole list of age-appropriate responsibilities for any of you who are parents, and it'll give you from two and three all the way up through high school of responsibilities. And then we we like to say you have expectations and responsibilities, but then you have to have what what Joel says is inspection. You know, you have to kind of make sure they're they're keeping up with it. And then, if they aren't, then there's consequences. And, and, those, and that's where I think often as parents, we fall down. We, we have expectations and we have these responsibilities, but we don't follow through and we're not consistent and we don't you know, keep those expectations up there. 